Hey everybody, welcome back to To Be Like Christ. We are talking about 2 Kings chapter 4 today in our 5-minute Bible study. The PDF is up on the screen and you can download it on our website at tobelikechrist.com if you want it. It's free out there. Let's talk about our timeline first of all. When did the events of 2 Kings chapter 4 happen? Well, these events probably fell within the window of about 900 to 885 BC, around 900 years before Jesus. Our main characters for this chapter are going to include Elisha, who took over as the prophet of God after God took Elijah to heaven. We have Gehazi, who was Elisha's servant, and then a Shunammite woman. This was a woman from Shunam who showed great generosity to the prophet Elisha. And then finally, the sons of the prophets. We've talked about this group of guys before. These were men who were seemingly students and sometimes servants to the prophets of God. They probably received some religious education from the prophets, but we don't know a whole lot about them. As we go over to our map and look at our key locations, Mount Carmel by the Mediterranean Sea is key to this chapter, as well as the city of Shunem and Gilgal. Now we can go over to our outline. Our first section, verses 1-7, through seven, Elisha and the widow's miraculous oil. So one of the sons of the prophets died, and he left behind a widow and, her two, uh, and their two children. The debt collectors were coming to this woman and threatening to take away her children as payment for the family debts and basically selling them or using them as slaves. Well, the widow went to the prophet Elisha for help. And when Elisha asked her what she had in her house, she responded that the only thing that she had was a jar of oil. Elisha told her to gather the empty contain any empty containers from her neighbors and from her friends, and then to pour oil from her jar into the empty jars. Well, God worked a miracle here. When she did, her oil jar never got empty, and she filled all the available empty containers until there were no empty containers left. No one else in her neighborhood had any empty containers that she could fill. Elisha then told her to sell all the oil and to pay her debts, and then she could live off the rest of the money. Next section, verses 8 through 17, Elisha prophesies a son for the Shunammite woman. Elisha often passed through the city of Shunem, and there was a woman there and her husband who were really kind to him. He often stayed with them, and eventually they decided that they were going to build a small addition to their house for Elijah to use, or sorry, Elisha to use when he visited. Now, this woman was very generous, but God had not blessed her with any children. Her and her husband were, well, her husband at least was old at this point. As a gift for her generosity, Elisha blessed the woman and promised her that she would have a son next year. And her son, just as Elisha said, was born the following year in the spring. Now we go to verses 18 through 37. Elisha raises the son of the Shunammite woman from the dead. One day, after this child who had been promised to the Shunammite woman had grown up, he fell sick and he died. The Shunammite woman took a donkey to find the prophet Elisha. She found him on Mount Carmel. And when she found him, she fell at his feet in distress and she, she told him what had happened to her son. Elisha returned with the Shunammite woman to her house where the boy's body was. And Elisha prayed to God and then he did something interesting. He laid on top of the boy. The text says, quote, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. Then he got up, walked across the house one time, and he repeated the process. We're not told why he did it this way, but we're just told that he did. The boy then sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. So Elisha, with the power of God and with this process, raised the boy from the dead and returned him to his mother. We're going to change gears a little bit in verses 38 through 41. We're going to talk about the poison stew or the, the poison soup. During a time of famine in Israel, a servant was preparing some stew for this group of guys known as the sons of the prophets. And he accidentally added this poison gourd to the stew, and it wasn't discovered until the men were already eating it. Well, again, Elisha works a miracle here. He purified the food by adding flour to the mixture. So just another record of one of the miracles of Elisha. And then finally, in verses 42 through 44, Elisha miraculously multiplies loaves of bread. So on another occasion, Elisha multiplied 20 loaves of bread to feed 100 men. It not only fed the men, but they also had leftovers. And if you know the stories about Jesus from the New Testament, this is very reminiscent of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 with just a few loaves of bread. And now finally, we will finish up with our application section. 
The miracles of Elisha, along with the miracles of Jesus, are one of wonderful illustrations of God's ability to fix a world that's plagued by things like poison, corruption, death, and scarcity. Elisha purified the corrupted spring of water in chapter 2, if you remember that, and he cleansed the poison stew here in chapter 4. God's power over death is seen in Elisha raising the Shunammite woman's son from the dead. Elisha also here multiplies the loaves of bread during a time of scarcity in Israel. Well, Jesus performed very similar miracles. He multiplied bread. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He healed the sick, and he fixed what was corrupted. So there's a better world coming, and this is what we have to look forward to. There's a better world coming, a, a world where we'll get to live in the presence of the power that fixes what is broken, where there will be no more scarcity, no more sickness, no more corruption, no more death. And these miracles that are recorded for us in the scriptures are a window into that world. That's the world that we're living for. That's the world that we're longing for.